Hello and welcome to the LND Go Beyond podcast, where we gather workplace learning insights from experts to enable the LND community go beyond the tradition. My name is Amit Garg, and this is episode number nineteen. Today we have Arun Pradhan joining us. Arun is an LND veteran with more than two decades of experience across academia and corporate. He is the founder of Learn to Learn, which is an app. and a campaign to help organizations develop a culture of continuous learning and individuals embrace learning agility he is also the co-founder of modelthinkers.com which is a new digital solution that empowers you to be smarter faster arun very welcome to the podcast thank you very much for having me and it's yeah an honor to be here so thank you very much my pleasure thank you so arun this is a very interesting uh, topic and i don't know very much about what you're going to share with us but i am uh, very interested so the topic that we have been uh, discussing is secrets of being smarter faster which is what model thinkers is uh, essentially focusing on so i'm very excited to learn from you you know what are the secrets that you want to share with us you want to start with some overview thoughts on that Yeah look I mean the main the main premise of model think is the way it helps you to be smarter faster and the the what we were what we were building off was some thinking from people like Charlie Munger quite well known obviously Berkenthaler Hashaway Hathaway um and you know Warren Buffett's right hand man and he talked about this idea to be you know in terms of like making a bigger impact in the world is to develop a lattice work of mental models and what he meant by that was to have um we we use the term mental models very broadly we talk about frameworks or concepts and the idea is that you are getting the big ideas from the big disciplines like you're almost stealing these big concepts from different areas of work and life and then you are creating a lattice work of them so typically you know most people when they are trying to solve a problem or work out something they tend to go to their one mental model their one framework or the one approach and they often are not very conscious about that if you ask someone how they work that out they won't know whereas someone who's trying to be um smarter and more innovative will have will have a whole toolkit of options there and will will and it's the interesting stuff often happens at the intersection between those frameworks yeah. Yeah. so essentially people who are not consciously looking at it may be having a few models which they rely on for almost everything that they think about and how do how they do things but what charlie munger is saying and what you are adapting here is build a bigger repository of mental models and probably you'll see greater things happening at the intersection of those models that's exactly it and to be more conscious about the combination like i know i mean i've been following you online as well and seeing how much you're reading recently for example and so you know you're consuming all these books and you're getting all these lessons from them and i think um that's one way to collect mental models because each each time you get a new concept you're absorbing that you are kind kind uh, tacitly kind of just impl- like absorbing it but the this approach is saying more consciously where does this where does this new concept fit into what i know and how does it play with these other ones and what sort of recipes can i make with these different concepts that I'm getting to make a bigger impact in my world. So it's being much more deliberate and conscious about collecting these mental models and and using them more dynamically. Every, yeah, to your point, everyone does it to a certain extent. Most people will do it very unconsciously. If you ask most people like to make a decision about whether they're going to go eat like yeah, you know, Indian food tonight or Thai food tonight, most people will just say something and they'll have a mechanism there that they would have used some sort of mechanism um to make that decision and they won't state what that you know it's hard for a lot of people to say what their decision making process was um but they essentially use like a a a framework or a mental model there and so trying to be more deliberate and conscious about it is is one way that you can be smarter faster basically that's it there's 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 a lot that i'm sure we unpack in there uh, yeah. So my first question to you is do you, do you really have a definition for a mental model like you said you know, a book can give you some ideas or it gives you a framework and you I think you mentioned that you create frameworks and other things also as models but how do you really define a mental model 
Yeah, I think um, for me, it's any sort of conceptual understanding of reality. And so I take a very broad understanding of it and we take a broad understanding with model thinkers. So, you know, if you think of your a good friend um, and you think about that friend, you don't think about them in their entirety. You yeah. think about that friend being, maybe you think about them being funny or loyal, or, you know, you think about their bushy hair, or you think about how an experience that you had with them when you were young. Yeah. So all those things are aspects, like they're representations of reality. You, we never think in terms of reality in its entirety because there's reality is so complex. There's so much there. We can't, our, our brains just can't handle reality. <laughs> so we have these, these representations of, of everything. Now, a representation of a pen is only so useful. Like, you know, you'll have a, you know, that's one, that's one, that's technically a mental model. And also um, mental biases or heuristics are technically mental models as well. So for example, confirmation heuristic or confirmation bias, technically a mental model. They're kind of like these quick shortcuts that you take. But the mental models that we're talking about are those, those mental models that are repeatedly useful, um, or the ones that are um, the way I, the more simple way I put it is those big ideas that have lasted the test of time or like made an impact in a particular discipline. And one of the things I think people don't do very well um, is there's a great idea in one area. Um, and how can you apply that in different contexts? We tend to be very siloed thinking about our mental models, very contextual. And so what, what another thing that uh, model thinkers is trying to do, and I think Charlie Munger promoted, is using these models in cross-disciplinary. So he would talk about how he'd pick up models from like physics or science, and he'd apply them to investing in business. And obviously he's done that to great effect. Mm, very interesting. Very interesting. Excellent. So uh, if, if we can dive a little deeper, you know, uh, do you have a list of secrets that you want to share with us? Uh, a few. Of them, <laughs> well, I think I think the I think the thing is um, for for L and D professionals especially is to just start thinking in terms of these mental models. So, like, there tends to be you know people tend to think about knowledge and skills. So knowledge tends to be um, stuff that you know. Skills tends to be stuff that you can do. So yeah. the way I tend to define it is skills are things that you need to practice. For example, so. And then there tends to be mindset and motivation and environment. They're the sort of four key factors for making a difference, right? Uh, in terms of behavior or making a difference in terms of performance, knowledge, skills, mi mindset, motivation, and environment. Now, when L&D professionals think about knowledge, they tend to think about information. And I guess what I'm trying to push rather than just thinking about information as just all information is equal, yeah. in today's age, you're really trying to outsource as much information as possible. So like, you know, you're trying to use tools and augment yourself with lists, checklists, or with like a GPS, so you don't have to remember your way around the city, you know, so you outsource some of that information. But the, the, the knowledge you do want to actually remember are these mental models. So what are the, for an L&D professional, when you're trying to shift any performance point or anything in, in, a, in a company or a group of people, I think the question isn't just what knowledge do people need to have. It's trying to understand what are their current mental models that they're using and they might not consciously use them but what are their current ones and what are ones that are going to actually um, provide greater impact here people will often go to frameworks that's a good start but i think there's a whole range of other mental models that people complain and i think that's really the, the big secret in terms of getting smarter it's just having a bit more being a bit more selective with um with those mental models Maybe it's best to go into some examples. Do you think, I mean, like, yeah, sure. So, I mean, like, I mean, there's a number of, for me, it's like trying to choose um, areas where, like, common challenges. Like, and we've done this with, like, on the site, we do, we create these things called playbooks uh -huh. and they're combinations of, of mental models. So uh, I'm just looking at them, at them now. So I'm just going to one which is called Change Their Mind. So if you're trying to be influential and you're trying to change someone's mind, you know, in this one, there's things like, you know, how, there's a curiosity zone, which is a, a method to be more curious. There's um, empathy map, which is something that's out of design thinking, but you can use an empathy map to actually understand the person you're trying to communicate with and to like empathize with them more effectively. There's a scarf model, which often comes out of leadership, 
which is David Rocks and the neuroscience piece around understanding what motivates and, and threatens people. Um, there's things like, you know, Chiodini's six principles of influence uh, or even feedback loops of understanding how, and feedback loop is a thing out of thermostats and science and biochemistry. But if you actually apply a, a feedback loop to this, when you're trying to influence someone, it's actually um, trying to actually set up mini experiments to try to take them with you. So there's this like cyclical, cyclical process of trying to convince someone. So you can see it like that. And there's many more on this. There's features and benefits, which is out of sales. So rather than talking about features, you're talking about how you can actually, like what's the impact for that person. So you can see what we've done is we've collected a bunch of mental, I mean, that was from science, from sales, from, uh, you know, from psychology, we, we collected ideas there that you can use to solve a particular problem. And so we've got some set ones, but I think it's up to individuals to work out what are the common problems that you're trying to solve for, and then choose mental models that will help. So rather than just go with the flow of what you normally do, be much more conscious about it. And that's what, so you can do that for yourself to be smarter, but then also when you're working with a cohort or group, you can encourage them to have this little toolkit and a shared language um, so they can actually do it together as well. Brilliant. So of course, you know, somebody has to do all of that uh, research work. And I'm sure you've done a lot of you know, workshops and assignments of this kind where you've combined some of these best fit models for a certain purpose. Like you mentioned about changing their mind, you have five, six, seven of those that you identified. So one of the yeah. things of course people can do is go to mental models uh, your website and check out which models are available possibly they are aligned as per some themes uh, etc so it makes it easier for them yeah that's we've tried to be a shortcut but i would suggest like it's a great starting point you can jump on model thinkers you can think of what are you trying to achieve you can type it in the search engine or you can go to playbooks and you can start looking at those lists but i also think the most value you can get overwhelmed. There's a lot of them there. Like we've got over 160, I think now. Um, so I think the point is to actually start pinning down the ones that you want to play with. And I think the starting point for that is um, I, I would use a mental model or a framework, which is a journey map for yourself. Like apply it to your audience or yourself. If it's, if it's, I say to yourself as well, because I think I'm a strong believer that rather than just apply these approaches to other people, we need to live them and champion them first. Um, and like, that's part of, for me, learning isn't about something that happens to people. It's something that people have to do. You know, the example I often give is like, you know, what in other industries, it's not like I would throw food at you or meat and call that eating. Like, you know, like, and yet in learning, we say that it's, it's that thing. So, um, so the, the point is we know that these people have to do it for themselves rather than just make like throwing things at them. We have to almost, role model and champion it ourselves. So that's why I think it's good to do it for yourself first. If you're doing it for yourself, like you're just drawing a journey map, think about your week, think about the big challenges you've got typically, the big decision, What's what sort of things are you having to deal with? Like if you're having to work in complexity, like you might wanna use Dave Snowden's uh, Kinefin uh, framework to actually understand complexity. You might wanna use like um, something out of the military, like the OODA loop to like take action quickly and to learn. Um, or you might want to use some prototypes and experimentation. Um, but if things are a bit more clear, but there's this debate amongst teams, you might want to use like a pew matrix and like that's a decision matrix where you, like a weighted table. So depending on what your need is, like it's going to be unique for each person and for each situation, but you can definitely use our site as a, as a, as a quick, a, like a quick start. But then if you're doing it for your audience, I would suggest, you know, personas or using jobs to be done. And like, you know, just understanding what audiences are trying to achieve. And then I, I, I use that performance analysis process of trying to work out, is it knowledge, skills, mindset, motivation, or environment that is really going to help them? Like, so basically I would work out what are behaviors, what are the things that are actually, we want them to do? And then what's the block? Is it knowledge, skills, mindset, motivation, or environment? And if it's um, you know, environment, that's often about nudging or processes. If it's about mindset and motivation, that's where you might use some other mental models around marketing and right. communication. Um, if it's about skills, it's about deliberate practice. And if it's about knowledge, that's where you dig into the mental models and the sort of concepts that you want them to learn rather than just information. What are the sort of 
What's the sort of like toolkit that you want in their head that will allow them to solve for these problems more? Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, you know, uh, what, what I gather from there, of course, is uh, for individuals, it's, it's a great starting point. If you are doing it for a, a cohort or a particular uh, goal, maybe you need to collate them and create some sort of a map even for those people. You know, as an individual, I think so. Yeah, if you're doing it for a group, I would just keep it pretty simple, like have a few, a few key concepts that you start using and testing with them. And you'll see like groups will start using it or not. Like, you know, like so Satya Nadella, when he went into Microsoft, he led with um, introducing nonviolent communication, uh, growth mindset. Um, like, you know, he used those, some of these key concepts, key frameworks, key mental models that he tried to introduce into the language. As a CEO, he could do that pretty effectively. Um, so I think in, in our world, like if we don't have access to that sort of um, like that sort of influence, it's harder. But you can do it. Like I think it's about trying to get your teams across particular kind of mental models. So they're all, I think the victory comes when everyone's speaking a similar language and using a, a similar approach that they can, they can at least um, reinforce each other to sort of like challenge each other around it. And if you think about it, similar language is also some sort of a model. Once you it is. Some... Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're representations of reality. And that's what, you know, I mean, back in the day, you know, Drucker, he talked about um, like, you know, one of the key things of high performing teams was shared mental models. Yeah. And you, you would have experienced it, I mean, like when you're, when you're t- having a conversation in a meeting and you think you have communicated what you, like you think it's pretty clear and everyone else thinks it's pretty clear and then everyone goes off and does their own thing because the mental model hasn't been actually effectively communicated. And that's why things like, you know, we know that like communicating visually is really important, um, like because even just using the whiteboard um, or capturing things on those post-it notes, they help to actually get those shared mental models and shared understanding more specific because while people are just talking in general terms it's so easy that we can all think we agree and then we all just go off and do different things so yeah i mean and model thinkers doesn't really help with that so much i think what what i'm focused on is what are the most interesting ideas the most useful ideas that are transferable across in the world and so like i read a lot as well and i'm constantly on the on the hunt for What's a gem that I can I can find? Like, you know, one of my favorites was Kunsagi, which was the Japanese approach of fixing crockery. Um, and like technically all it is is if you have broken crockery, you fix it with gold thread. Yeah. And you know, you, you probably would have seen it, right? Yeah. And technically that's just a that's just something about crockery. But if you actually use that as a mental model, you could actually use that as a frame to actually have a different view of failure have a different view of mental health, have a different view of, of life and like consumer society. Like there's so many ways you can use that. So um, they're the ones I like of just being able to pick up something like the Predo principle is one of my favorites, the 80, 20 rule, because that's so versatile that came out of quality assurance. And yet I use that to clean the kitchen. I use that to do some of the biggest projects I've worked on, like, you know, multi-million dollar projects, I've used the Prio principle to get cut through and to work out where to get impact. And then if I've got 20 minutes to clean the kitchen, I'll also use it. I work out where's my biggest impact going to be here. <laughs> so, you know, like it's not necessarily cleaning the forks. It's like doing the big pots and then moving on. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. No, I think, I think that makes it uh, uh, clearer in terms of, you know, how the transferability of models happen and uh, yeah. you know, how, how should we really consider that? Excellent. Uh, if I can just go back to what you initially, or when you started responding to this one, you mentioned about, you know, uh, the knowledge, skills, uh, motivation, Mindset, and yep. the environment. Right? Yes. Uh, one of the things that you talked of is the LND needs to think about what mental models they are thinking of transferring or building, which will be uh, probably with an objective of making it the most efficient for them to work or you know be productive or deliver whatever they have to yeah. uh, now within there uh, is there a, a element of maybe considering 
when you say environment there is a lot of information that can lie in environment there is uh, and we don't have to really push it into uh, people's brains or minds we don't have to really retain it so they are being supported by what is there in the environment so the model itself maybe even your best performers may be using it uh, inefficiently because the environment is not very efficient and the organization has to really look at all of these parameters all four of them to see what's the most efficient model and then work with that to see if how how best people can be trained on that yeah absolutely just say for example if there was a if i was working with a sales team and in one context what i typically do is i identify this is my whole performance consulting method i would use but like i basically identify what are the behaviors that are required for this team to do differently what what actions do they have to take differently than they are now to get greater performance uh-huh. and then just say one of them was to actually have more needs based conversations right um that's a typical sales requirement uh-huh. then you actually identify in that context what will give you the biggest impact is it skills is it knowledge is it mindset motivation is it environment so you know it might be that the person doesn't know doesn't know m- much about skill needs based conversations frankly that's more likely to be a skill it's something that they even if they know about it they might have some mental models there but it's about practice so you can't just do it off the top of your head but in another context so in one area it might be about skill in another context they might have the skill but they might not be motivated they might think well it's just easier for me to sell this other stuff and i'm not motivated like so that it's more about my mindset motivation and in another environment they might be motivated they might have the skill but the environment they might be on kpis which require them to be on 10 minute phone calls and not have time to have um performance based conversation so absolutely i think in each context as a performance consultant um which l and d should be we need to dig and find out what's the real causal factors here um and there's always multifactorial but you can again pl- apply the pareto principle if i just make 20% impact here what what's going to get my 80% results and that's what i look for fantastic all right uh what else uh, do you have are there more secrets <laughs> <laughs> i mean lots more secrets but i mean look i think i think i'd encourage people uh in an l&d world is like these days i i often talk about the t-shaped model like you know um as things are becoming more automated the 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 cognitive food chain if you like is getting pushed up like if you're just doing stuff that can be done simply and routinely your job will not exist uh it's only a matter of time so the fact is we're requiring people to go up that cognitive food chain and be and and to be more creative to be make more interesting decisions and so on so from a L&D perspective i would really encourage you to um lead the way by doing that yourself so if your job is just more functional just like turning out e-learning for example like honestly how long is it going to be there's already initiatives in this space until like you know you can get a bit of a performance assessment and then there's going to be some like automated generic kind of content built from a mix between wikipedia and some other sources just spat at that person which is totally personalized like I'm not saying that's going to happen tomorrow. It's got there's some initiatives in that space already. I think that's what Donald Taylor and stuff and people like that are working on, but like but I wouldn't say it's landed yet. So my que- my question is how are you going to push yourself up that cognitive food chain? And I think one of the best ways you can do that is by collect more consciously collecting those big ideas from the big disciplines and not overdoing it, just taking one or two like, you know, steal some from sales. Like you can literally go on model thinkers and just look up sales and marketing. and you could just steal a few or from data or from whatever field you want just and psychology and then you could just take one or two of those ideas and start applying that in your world. I mean that's what I did. That's basically how I su- succeeded. I was an early adopter of design thinking before like now everyone does it. I was one of the first to do it and that was because I was interested I was interested from a mental model point of view in parenting and I learned some key concepts around design thinking and parenting and then looked at UX world and then applied that to my work. So that's why I was an early adopter and then I was trying to change my own behavior so I got interested in behavioral economics and stole a bunch of stuff there and that's how I got interested in nudge theory before it was popular. So it's just be curious and start stealing from other other disciplines is what I'd encourage people to do. And model thinkers is a great way to do that. You can read a whole bunch of books, you can talk we talk to so many great subject matter experts from across different fields. Just be curious around them and just 
capture those great ideas and think about experimenting them with them in your context. Great. Uh, if, if I if I were to tie it back to the T shape that you talked of, uh, what you are uh, essentially suggesting is, you know, you continue to focus on the vertical that you are in, but get so many ideas from elsewhere and bring it back to your domain, which is the the vertical part of the T, right? Yeah. And keep picking stuff, big ideas from other domains, just like Charlie Munger said, and what you just described about the various fields that you borrowed from. Exactly. I think that's such a great way to like, you can keep digging yourself deeper and deeper. I, and I talked to, um, I was, I was doing a program with some engineers last year and I, and they were not convinced about going T-shaped. And I was saying to them, look, you can keep getting better at Python, but frankly, my 15 year old's pretty good at Python and he's going to be at your backs in a couple of, in a couple of months. Right. So there's only so good you can get there, but imagine if you had some commercial acumen and you had some communication skills and you you basically did the skill stacking and you went broad with some other disciplines and you also went broad with your your social your um, soft skills or professional skills then you suddenly become this person who is quite future-proofed so yeah definitely go deep but and i and i think the 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 certainly i i this is my own experience like I, i've been i would say i'm relatively successful in my career and it's not necessarily because i was the best learning experience designer it was because i've been really good at stealing from other disciplines and combining with my own discipline and like finding something which seems really innovative to people around me but really i've just copied something from over there and combined it with what i know and come up with something different charles ulcher it's one of it's one of the models on our site he talks about he calls it idea sex he says rather than just focusing on one big specialty you just get two ideas combine them and become the specialist in that intersection. And so, you know, you know, Star Wars, all sorts of things have come from those, those intersections. So what are the two things that you're going to experiment with? One of them is your field. And the next one, like just literally go on model thinkers, choose one at random and start playing with the intersection and see where it takes you. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> and, and you keep saying stealing from, you know, other, other areas. I, I, I use the word borrow from other ideas. <laughs> how, how okay, I'll, if that helps yeah. you, then borrow. <laughs> what our listeners will prefer. But I, I love, I love knowledge. Like, I mean, I love mental models because when, as soon as I, it's the one thing, like you know, food or money, you know, you 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 take it and it goes for the other person. But yeah. when you share knowledge, you're actually gaining. The person who's sharing knowledge is yeah. gaining just as much as the person yeah. who's taking it. So for me, it's it's such a fun thing to play in because it's so it's got this level of abundance that nothing else does so i mean i i encourage people to look up on the model thinkers the feynman technique which you probably know it's like the feynman technique is this idea of explaining something um to someone like they're like to an imaginary eight-year-old so you're having to as you're learning so you're having to use analogies and metaphors and so there's such a value it's a learning method to explain things so I just think taking these ideas from other people, you're actually doing them a service as well. And then you're doing something unique with it because you're combining things in your own way. As long as obviously attribute the ideas, but um, yeah, make that combination, do the mix and, and um, just see what havoc you can create. I think it's a great, great um, opportunity for people. Fantastic. Uh, Arun, so uh, for l &D teams, you know, so I I'm trying to bring in uh, the, the fact that learning is uh, not easy. It's yeah. a little hard and a lot of L&D teams tend to make it easy, you know, by not giving the right amount of challenge or difficulties or even practice to their yeah. learners. Uh, and maybe it is guided by level one, level two feedback that they really care about, etc. But if we accept the fact that learning is not easy, is growth mindset the model that, uh, most of the LND teams should be first, you know, imparting and letting people absorb that because unless they have that, they can't really put the right effort into learning itself. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not, I don't tend to talk about growth mindset that often these days. I think the the evidence around it has been a bit mixed. Yeah. Um, and so, but I do, I don't want people to throw out the, the intention of, that with the, some of the mixed research, because I think the point of it was um, that people need to have agency and they need to have some level of resilience around their learning. 
and some sense of focus. So, I mean, it's, it comes back to people's motivation, people's um, attitude that they can learn and that they're willing to learn. And the thing I like about growth mindset is that even though I don't use it very often, I hate when people make assumptions that where people are now is a static factor. Um, whether that, and you see that in t- in um, organisations when they first when they move to recruit rather than build. Um, and I understand you have to recruit, you have to buy or borrow when it's time pressure because, as you say, learning takes a while. But I think if people are wanting to, they, there is a lot of opportunity for people to develop. I'm I'm very optimistic in people's ability to learn. Um, so, and grow. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. So I don't use the term growth mindset. Um, I, what I would say is the focus on learning of learning teams ideally would be arming their audience with basically a learning literacy and learning understanding of basic learning science um, so they can actually learn more effectively for themselves and take that agency. Yeah, part, part of growth, I... I I'm completely with you. There has been mixed research on growth mindset, and more recently, yes. Uh, but yeah, the, the beauty of that is you know making people believe that you, know, you need effort, you know, and and if you want yeah. to think that it is going to be easy and uh, this is yeah. I mean, the, the model I the model I prefer is actually um you know the Bjork's desirable difficulties. You know, the work yeah. from the yeah. the Californian the Bjork right. um, husband and couple. Yeah. The work they did around desirable difficulties. And linked to that with like things like deliberate practice. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding that learning, like even we, we reinforce it because, you know, people do smiley sheets after they do a course. Did I, did I have fun? Did I enjoy that? Whereas really, if some of the ones that, you know, yourself, like everyone knows themselves, some of your biggest learning moments came through really moments of discomfort. Right. Um, if you were able to reflect on those moments of discomfort and, and really be honest with them, that's where you can often learn. So people are going to fail you on a on a N- NPS score or something like that. Um, <laughs> I think that's where Will Thalama has done some great work in terms of trying to reframe those smiley sheets to try to actually, because we know from a fact, like even the fact that, um, for example, things like space re- retrieval, which we know works from an evidence-based point of view, that when people space things out and test themselves, they're going to learn more. But we also know with from a lot of research that when people do that, they think they're learning less. And when when people actually learn without retrieving and in one big go all at once, they think they're learning more. So people can't, we can't trust those initial opinions. We need to, and that's where I think we can't just do learning to people. You can't just throw food at people. You can't just throw training at people. We've got to actually do a basic level of empowerment of our people so and that, that's one of the things I'm doing with my team at the moment is like we're tr- defining the learning language that we want to introduce into the company that I'm working for now to say, what is the learning literacy that we're going to use? How are we going to, imp- how are we going to empower our users? They don't want to know about all the, the, the geeky stuff. Yeah. They just want to know about the hack at the top. Like, you know, so deliberate practice is one of the hacks um, that we'll probably use. And and space retrieval is another one. So there's probably going to be about 10 that we're just going to popularize um, across the company. So everyone in the company can have a shared language of understanding. If they want to dig deeper, we'll show them the evidence. And from a design point of view, our designers will actually try to build for those evidence-based approaches. But we want to arm our people with ways to learn more effectively as well and take that agency on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's going to be very interesting and very useful because once people get on board with that, you know, I think I think they will take the responsibility of learning onto themselves. Well, that's my plan, but let's see. Cool, cool. <laughs> like, let's have this conversation again in a year, and I'll tell you how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> also, to your point about you know some of your best learnings come from you know uncomfortable experiences and. I, I love the phrase that uh, uh, Clark Quinn has been using it for it, hard fun. Yeah. You know, which is not all fun, but... But there's a payoff there. Correct. You know, yeah. You, you, you had a, a, a tough game that you play, but you enjoy that, right? Whether you win or lose, yeah. but you're learning in the process. 
Fantastic. And that's when I think I don't want to be lost with that growth mindset because I think there were some attitudinal things that I really enjoyed with growth mindset, like the the idea that when something bad happened or a failure happened, that it was actually potential learning experience rather than, um, and I've seen it for myself, you know, with my kids, the ones, one, ones who are naturally good at things, they tend to, having not gone through challenges, they they have less of a sense of their ability to learn. They have a sense of being good at something, but they don't necessarily have a sense of ability to learn. So I think those challenges for people and to accumulate those challenges in your life so you can see them. And um, what I've seen really great in some companies is where they try to share those stories from different people, like including leaders. So leaders are uh, telling stories about how they had really trouble learning I don't know, it could be anything from playing the ukulele to learning Excel and and they're sharing those stories. So we can so when you look at someone, you don't think of, oh, I'm not as good as them. You think of, well, they've gone through X, Y, and Z to get there. What do I want to go through to get and where do I want to go? So there's a bit better sense that everything's fluid like that. You can actually learn through challenges. I, mean, I have seen uh, you know, my daughter was uh, told about growth mindset in school when she was in grade four and i think it has stuck with her and she she kind of refers to that you know in in conversations and saying i understand but so she would bring some of those learnings back whenever yeah. she was some sort of failure so yeah i think it can stay with yeah, you my kids my kids still say um <laughs> i don't know that yet yeah um, that's which i really enjoy I, I love it every time i hear that so yeah. that's a yeah. great phrase yeah. All right. Uh, Arun, uh, one of the posts I think you had was on uh, on men- model thinkers was on uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yes, that's <laughs> that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite models. It's actually uh, we call it the map versus territory. Yeah. The quote is from George Box, and he talked about all model. He was actually talking about data analysis, but I think it it, it holds. He said, all models are wrong. Some of them are useful. And I think it's a really useful um, understanding because uh, if you understand that what you've got when you're thinking about something um, is a mental representation of reality, it's not reality, you can actually be a bit more humble and a bit more creative to actually see that there are actually several perspectives on something. Like, so the typical story people use, I think the, 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 we tell the story of the um, subway in the in the summary, which I would encourage people to look at because it's more visual. But the other story that comes to mind is the the classic folk tale about the elephants. Like you know how yeah. the the blind men and they're reaching, and one says this is a tree, and one says this is a snake, and it's one of those things that each of them had a mental model for what they were experiencing, yeah. and all of them, like more than one thing, can be true. Yes, there was a trunk there. Yes, there was something like a snake there. Um, it was an elephant as well. So. It wasn't that they were like they were wrong. It wasn't exactly a snake, but each of their interpretation, there was a certain amount of truth to it. Because, and it's just trying to work out which mental model is is correct. So, like you know, we even went from what was it? Like we went from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics, and at the time, Newtonian physics explained a lot, and now Einsteinian physics explains a lot. There'll be another version that will like disrupt. Einsteinian physics, especially I imagine with quantum theory or something. I'm, I don't know enough about physics, but I expect that, you know, constantly that scientific method is trying to get closer to reality, but knowing it's it's quite an elusive, complex beast. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but, but that also got me thinking about, you know, uh, does it really contribute if you have that sort of a model or a you know, meta model that yeah. while you're working with models, uh, most of them are wrong. So uh, we need to have flexibility while we're using them. And is that really contributing to what we look at as, uh, or has a parallel with flexible knowledge versus uh, fixed knowledge, which uh, as your expertise grows, and I think it has a parallel with the P-shaped thing. As you are you know, diving deeper and becoming an expert in your domain, and you bring new experiences from outside or you become more experienced, the knowledge itself becomes a little more flexible and you are able to take into account all the variations that can potentially happen. 
Yeah, I, I think experience is really interesting because, you know, people talk about do you trust your gut feel, feeling on things, for example, or do you use your mental models? Like gut feelings are ba basically pattern recognition that your body is absorbed, right, um, from, from countless experiences and observation. And that's really important. Like, you know, there's neurons all around your body. We don't, like I, I, mental models talks about um, the thought process that goes on in your kind of conscious mind. We actually think with our whole bodies and we think much more complicated in more complicated ways, as you know. But um, I think when your gut theory is right, it means that you're experienced in something and that something is consistent with past events. So they're two big provisos. So before I trust my gut, I ask myself, do I have experience here? And is anything unpredictable happening? Like, is anything different happening? If it's not particularly different based on my observation, and if I've had experience in it, I trust my gut. So like, you know, if the friend who's ripped you off five times asks you for money and nothing has changed and you've got that experience, you probably want to trust your gut, right? <laughs> but just say if they've won the lotto, <laughs> or something's different like you know then you know so it's just a very stupid example but whereas generally you can't trust your gut like generally you want to actually use more conscious thinking and and like actually like if if you're not experienced in something or if the situation has changed you want to actually go to a more conscious approach and in that more conscious approach i think it is really good as you say you can be more flexible more humble by just pulling together these are the three mental models i'm going to use in this context right now and experimenting a little if it doesn't work you let them go and you use some other ones most people will just use their one mental model they'll have a fixed view and they'll just keep banging on reality until it fits into their view it's confirmation bias um you know they'll just they'll make everything fit like you know i think it was dan early who talked about we're not just irrational we're rationalizing we totally rationalized reality against what's going on. So, you know, having that view of the map versus territory, that mental models are all wrong, it allows you to just hold, hold strong opinions lightly, to hold them, to test them, and then to keep moving them on if they're not working in that situation. So, yeah, I think it allows for a, a level of adaptability. So. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, one last question from my side. Uh, you, you initially talked about, you know, uh, all the reading that you do. I've been doing quite a bit of reading recently. And so you tend to kind of correlate ideas from, you know, one reading to another. And some of them could be happening at the subconscious level. Yeah. Right. So is there something happening there in terms of mental models where you are structuring ideas in your mind at the subconscious level because you've been exposed to you know, some big ideas, some interesting things in your different exposures? Yeah, I think that's such a really interesting question. Look, one of my favorite models is one of my top five is the extended mind theory. If you want to jump on and just look up extended mind theory model thinkers, it was it took me one of the longest to summarize, but it's basically this idea that we, you know, the, the, the conscious voice in our head is only part of our thought process that we think with our bodies, we think with our brain, with our, with our environment. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah, so I think there's a lot more happening than just that conscious voice. I think conscious mental models work for that, but how you tie those subconscious things together, there are actually techniques for that. Like, you know, um, Barbara Oakley talked about focused and diffuse thought mm -hmm. and taking breaks, using sleep, like we know if you, if you are learning something and you sleep on it or if you go for a walk, that allows your subconscious to better integrate and to make those diffuse connections. So, yeah, I think if you structure your day to help make those, those um, diffuse connections, and I do think it is helped by the, probably, perhaps the strongest, everyone, this has becomes cliche, but I just, the more I learn, the more I understand how important curiosity is just being able to have that playful curiosity and not just thinking that you've got the answer if, it, if it's working, but just having that playful curiosity about what if and how might this work and when some person who's done it new and you thought did it stupidly, you're just playing with their ideas of what, what did you observe, how would that work in your context? So making those diverse connections, both consciously and subconsciously. So consciously you can do it by just being curious and playful and subconsciously you can support it by taking breaks, 
um, pacing out things. Um, you can also use the Zykonik effect where, you know, the Zykonik effect was the one where the woman and the, Aust the Austrian psychologist in the restaurant noticed that uh, waiters were remembering orders. They didn't have notepads, but they remembered orders when the person didn't pay their bills, but they would forget orders if someone paid their bills. We have a sense of mental accounting in our head. So if you, if you want to actually get your subconscious to do some work for you, one technique, as well as using in combination with focus and diffuse thought, is to actually interrupt the work, interrupt the idea. So you see this with TV shows. They leave you on a cliffhanger. So then you're thinking about, well, what's going to happen? What's gonna... And so obviously you're going to go back. because you get to... Whereas if you hit the end and it's complete, you know, you don't want to go back again. So same with ideas and learning. So if there's something I want to think about and I want my subconscious to do work on, I will literally stop halfway through writing about it or halfway through a problem while I'm feeling quite unsettled because my brain will, will pick that up and subconsciously play with it. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think there's so many brilliant thoughts here. And of course, you've referenced uh, you know, so many different sources. I'm glad I could make sense of at least half of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I think pretty much everything I've mentioned is is like a summarized model on model thinkers. Almost <laughs> almost all of them, I think, except the KSME model, um, yeah. is all there. So yeah, yeah the that's... extended mind one I, I remember I had shared in my network also, which was yeah. Like, yeah yeah yeah. That's one of my favorites. It's actually again, it's it's so um, it just draws you into thinking more about how you use drawing. Like when you when you're thinking of an idea rather than just drawing it out for someone to explain it, yeah. how you can sketch things to help you think. Yeah. And, you know, whiteboard for yourself. Don't just use it for communication to come up with ideas. Um, so things that you're probably doing anyway, but just the thought that your brain isn't, your thinking isn't just your conscious voice. It's actually all the environment around you. It's, it's a strong idea. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is fantastic. Uh, anything else that uh, you think you would want to add here? I think it's been a fantastic conversation. Oh, no, I've really enjoyed it. I think probably the one the one model I'd leave people with is compounding, which everyone probably knows. It's like, you know, it's considered one of, what was it, the eighth miracle of the world, people call it, like compounding in financial concepts. But I would also apply it to learning. So, you know, I have mentioned a lot of mental models and like, you know, there's a lot of books out there. There's a, It's very intimidating. I would encourage people and th that's why we, we created a newsletter like to go one 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 model per week so don't overdo it don't throw yourself in and then get intimidated just whether you use our newsletter or whether you just choose an idea from a book or from model thinkers or whatever or from a, someone you know just play with one idea a week to try to integrate it into your world and ideally you do it with a few people because that's always going to be more effective but if you just keep doing that it's going to compound and within a year, like you will just have like, you know, so much impact, especially if you keep integrating them with the last one. Um, it's, it's not just adding more. It's actually creating that lattice work and the combination. So that's where the real strength is. So I'd encourage people just go slowly, just focus on one, your next big concept that you want to experiment with or framework you want to experiment with, play with that for a while and then do your next one and just repeat. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. So, what do we call this? Uh, Arun's compounding model for learning? Ah, uh, no, I think it's already it's already a thing. I think you could just <laughs> just do it and have fun. I'm, it's probably stuff I've stolen from everywhere else. Like compounding already exists, learning already exists. Again, you just combine yeah, them, and it's a, it's combining a thing. Combining the two is powerful. Yeah, exactly, it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're so right. You know, uh, like we discussed for so many things earlier. You know, as you keep reading or exposing yourself to newer ideas you invariably tend to you know, see the connections and overlaps and intersections. And yeah. what you are suggesting with this is be a little more conscious about integrating them. So as you exactly. explore a new model, just keep integrating, even if it is for a moment, but any new idea that comes up would be brilliant. Absolutely. I mean, one of the best tips I give people, I think, is um, the feedback I've gotten when I was running these sorts of programs is if you want to get started, choose something that you've learned in your family life that you know that you've learned like you know from um like you know it might be from your partner or from your child that you use a mental model or approach that you use typically there and try to that apply that in your work and then do vice versa like take something in your work and try to apply it at home and what you're doing there is you're taking a concept or an approach or a mental model or a framework in one silo 
and you're trying to use it in a different silo. So even if you're in a sporting team, think about something that you've done there, that you've learned there, and try to pick that up and use it in a totally different context. Frankly, that's intelligence right there. Intelligence is your ability to pick up concepts and use them in different in different situations to solve problems, really. That's kind of like one version of intelligence. So you're actually building your intelligence and being smarter just by doing that. And you can do that right now. Like, I mean, honestly, that again, that's how I became, I mentioned how I became a, a leading person in design thinking because I was doing that sort of stuff with my kid based on a book I bought. And then it wasn't called design thinking, but it was those sorts of concepts. So then when I heard about design thinking, it seemed so familiar. Okay. And all my parenting which was a theoretically, and I was working part-time like doing parenting. It wasn't going to support my career. That's what fast-tracked my career because I, I picked up what I learned there and applied it in my work. So I'd encourage you just to try to break out of your silos and pick up these concepts and play with them in different contexts. Mm. Fantastic. No, brilliant ideas and uh, suggestions there. Are, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me on the show and I really appreciate your work. And, I'm looking forward to more summaries of the books you're reading so I can I can do you can do some of the work for me in capturing some of those mental models I want to put on model thinkers. <laughs> sure, sure. I would love that opportunity. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Amit. Thank you very much. Thank you.